So uh, we're, we're doing the hat trick for people with Wisconsin connection. Um, so obviously I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And uh, being from Wisconsin, have to talk about cheese. Um, and I think what we're going to be going through will, you can figure out from our whole discussion from this morning as well as this afternoon, that the whole idea of reducing sodium in any food product can be a very complex system. And that uh, within their dairy products also. Now when I'm going to be focusing, I'm going to be looking at both natural cheeses and processed cheeses and the reason why I'm focusing on that is because a lot of the other dairy products such as yogurt, uh, cultured, other kinds of milk products like buttermilk and sour cream, yogurt, don't really have a whole lot of salt in to begin with. Therefore we aren't really concerned about those. But if you take a look at the whole portfolio of cheeses all the way from something like a Parmesan cheese to a cheddar to a mozzarella, we have a really big wide variety of things. And then processed cheese also really encompasses a fairly wide variety of products, such as things that you might find uh, as slices that get put onto hamburgers versus something that might be in a cheese stick, which would be a cheese food, as well as cheese sauces. And all of those are, we're gonna be taking a look at what are gonna be some strategies in order to reduce salt for those particular products and what are gonna be some of the limitations and all of that. So once again, uh, what we're looking at is really a very complex system. So when we take a look at low salt versus high salt, so one thing we heard a lot about is if you have a low salt food product, you can enhance the ability for both pathogens as well as spoilage microbes to be able to grow. And in order to make that food safe, in order to preserve it for long periods of time, you may require other kinds of formulation modification to make sure that it's going to be stable. On the other hand, let's take a look at the bad things about uh, having something that's high salt, is that there's going to be differences in susceptibility or uh, uh, resistance for salt tolerance. And actually, in some cases, you might be inhibiting some spoilage microbes and actually may select for pathogens, depending upon what that food product and the rest of the constituencies are going to be. Um, in products that are going to have very high salt and therefore lower water activity, they might actually have a protective type of an effect if you are using certain kind of processing procedures, such as high pressure pasteurization. When we take a look at sodium products in general, there are going to be some sodium-based salts that will have some inhibitory properties, such as sodium chloride, and other ones which might not be inhibitory, such as sodium citrate or um, you know, other types of sodium things. Um, so when we're going to be taking a look at this, once again, we want to take a look at the big picture. One uh, quote that I found from uh, 2007 to me was very disturbing, because this demonstrates the thinking that it's simple all the way across the board for inhibition of microbes. And what that quote said was, typical food spoilage bacteria or unaffected by various salt levels we tested, which means that low salt foods are just as safe as conventionally processed ones. And I'd like to put a big X around that because it is not necessarily true. We have to understand among the various um, microbes in there, there's going to be variation in salt tolerance. And this includes even our starter cultures. So if we put uh, a starter culture in a fermented meat product, we have a tendency to put the, meat, uh, the salt in at the same time as a starter culture, and they do their own little happy thing in producing the acids. On the other hand, if you're making a cheese, you go through the fermentation process first, and at the end of the culturing process, then you sprinkle on the salt. Because if you added the salt on it to begin with, those particular starter cultures would not be as active, and you wouldn't have as much of an acid production. So we have to take a look that even in our starter cultures, we're going to have difference in acid tolerance. Uh, or sorry, salt tolerance. When it comes to pathogens, um, listeria is known as being very salt tolerant, Staph aureus can be very salt tolerant, and compare that with something like E. coli 15787, which may have a lower salt tolerance. When we are taking a look at, the, once again, the big picture for factors that are used in microbial inhibition, pH and water activity are going to be the two main driving factors for any microbial inhibition. And water activity is fairly frequently the function of combination of moisture and a salt content. So even at any given moisture content, the higher the salt 
uh, that you have the lower water activity. And you can have a lower water activity uh, if you have even a high moisture, but if you have a really high salt level, you can reduce that water activity. So once again, a complex system. When we're taking a look specifically at cheese products, we're really limited with what we're going to be able to add to that product, primarily because of standards of identity. And unlike in a meat product where we might have replaced the sodium chloride with other types of sodium-based salt or potassium-based salt, we can add sodium nitrite, which gives lower levels of sodium, but still has very powerful antimicrobial activity. Once again, in a dairy product, we don't have those types of opportunities. So in a natural cheese, we're going to be really focusing on starter cultures and non-starter lactic acid bacteria, which will serve as competitive microflora. You'll also be taking a look at acid production. It might be in the form of lactic acid or propionic acid, depending upon what that starter culture is going to be. And then we're once again left with that overall pH water activity, whether or not it's a high moisture or low moisture type of uh, cheese product. Processed cheese products are going to be different in the fact that you have now given them a certain kind of heating step which will get rid of that starter culture and that competitive microflora. So now you're left with a blank stellate and all you're looking at are strictly that pH, water activity combinations, and whatever other antimicrobial activity we can, uh, antimicrobial ingredients we can put in there to enhance the safety. Without those antimicrobial ingredients, without sufficient amount of salt or reduced water activity, then we do rely more heavily on proper storage temperature. And people have a tendency to think that processed cheese is a very stable product, and so if you put on a little sign that says keep refrigerated on it, they may not necessarily read it because they think that all these processed cheeses are going to be shelf stable. So once again, we are not necessarily looking for problems. We are trying to find solutions to our problems. So what can we do in order to reduce the sodium salt, reduce the overall sodium content in our cheese products? And once again, it's going to depend upon if we're looking at a natural cheese versus a processed cheese. First of all, I really liked uh, going to something that's a little bit more obvious, which is if I'm going to be looking at those primary factors of uh, pH and water activity, what can I do to re uh, reduce the pH, increase the acidity of that food product? There have been some attempts in substituting the sodium salts with potassium salts. We'll discuss a little bit more about that. Um, there's potential for using protective cultures in some of the cultured uh, products, particularly in cheese products. This is really at its infancy, and not many uh, protective cultures are available, and so we won't be providing a whole lot of information about that. But we will mention about cultured dairy solids, which might, once again, provide some additional organic acids, as well as maybe some bacteria activity, and in the cases of uh, a processed cheese product, may be able to look at sorbic acid as an alternative to having salt in there. So the work that I'm going to be presenting today has pretty much been industry-based uh, research. And one of the things that we started looking at is what is going to be the effect in a natural cheese. And as I said, competitive microflora is really a critical uh, part of the overall safety in a natural cheese. So what if we're trying to pull that out and find out what else we're going to be finding out? What's more important? Is it going to be salt or is it going to be the uh, pH that's going to be the driving factors? So what happened is we took a model system. It was called a cheddar cheese extract. And it looks like it's clear liquid, but it's going to have all the goodies that's going to be in a cheese uh, that might be in the water phase. And so it's going to include the salt. It's going to include the lactate and any other things that might come in from the starter culture. When we took a look at what happened in that model system without the competitive microflora and compared the survival in uh, a higher salt versus a lower salt cheddar cheese extract with salmonella, staph aureus, listeria, and E. coli, what we found out was of all of them, actually sugar toxin produced in E. coli had greater survivability than the other pathogens. Once again, when we take a look at what might happen in a real world cheddar cheese, we also can find out that sugar toxin produced in E. coli have long survivability in a natural cheddar. Eventually they'll die off, but they die off fairly slowly. When once again drill down what were the real, real driving factors in it, find out that lower pHs and high lactate levels, which came from the starter culture, had greater uh, impact on inactivation of the shikatoxin producing E. coli than even the high salt alone. So we're using this kind of effect to realize that, yes, 
for this particular type of uh, food product, as well as taking a look at several different pathogens, the driving factor may not necessarily be salt, but it may be the pH and the uh, lactate levels. So when we take a look at it in a real type of system, um, this was work that was taking a look at things that might be out in the real world as well as things that were produced in the laboratory. But what we're going to be able to see over here is comparing uh, a traditional uh, cheese, a traditional higher salt cheese with 1.7% uh, salt versus a lower salt cheese, which had only 0.7% salt. And then what you can do is take a look at what's going to happen to the effect uh, on the um, culture, the starter culture, and what might translate to its activity in producing acid. One thing that they found out is that the starter culture is much more active in a lower salt product than in a higher salt product. And as a result, the pH was going to be lower at the end of production than uh, it would be in a traditional salt product. So in this particular case, if you look at the top line of wash for each one of those categories, the pH at the end of uh, culturing for the washed ones for traditional was a 5.2. For the low sodium one, the pH was a 5.3. But this was a wash system, so what they did was they took out any of that extra lactic acid. If you took a look at the no-wash one, which would be more representative of what the starter culture is going to do, the pH, once again, for the no-wash one for the traditional one was a 5, versus the, the no-wash for the reduced sodium one was a 4.8. So what we're seeing here is that Without the salt, you have greater um, starter culture activity, more acid production, and there's going to be more acid. So you think, wow, this should be a great thing. So reduced salt cheese should be a safer product because you have more acid in there. But what we have to take a look as the next uh, issue is the fact that you have the higher acidity, you have potentially uh, poorer quality throughout the shelf life. So what the um, manufacturers are going to do is then uh, take uh, the curd, they're going to wash off the excess acid, and now you're left with a higher pH product than you would without having that starter culture in there. So ultimately, what you're looking at for a real product would be under the washed ones that's going to have low sodium, higher pH, and now you don't have that same level of safety as you do in a traditional product. So here's an example where we are looking at um, the fate of shikatoxin-producing E. coli in a low-salt cheddar, comparing it with a full-salt cheddar. And uh, what we are going to see in here, if I can find the pointer, um, is two different types of products, pH of a 5.7 and a 5.4. When we have the lower pH, and it didn't matter if we had a 1.3% added salt or 1.8% salt, both of them had the same level in activation of shikadoxa producing E. coli during storage. Under the other hand, with the higher pH value, the high salt product, we had greater inactivation than what we did at the lower salt product. So once again, demonstrates the complexity here. If you're going to be able to keep that pH down lower, you have an ability to have reduced salt product. If the pH is going to be higher, you will not have that same level of protection. Then what we did was we took a look at a much higher moisture product, which happened to be a mozzarella. And in this case, we had a pH of a 5.8. And this has a whole different constituency with the, than what the cheddar did. And this particular thing, we had the target microorganism of Listeria monocytogenes in there and found out that regardless of what the salt content was, we had very substantial amount of growth of Listeria monocytogenes. And it didn't matter if it was a full salt or reduced salt product, it still was going to be a potentially unsafe product. So in this particular case, we're looking at, once again, how are we going to enhance the safety of that product? And we used 1% uh, of a cultured dairy product, which was a fermentate, probably a combination of some organic acids as well as bactericin activity. And we found out that that substantially delayed the growth of listeria throughout the shelf life. And once again, we were able to demonstrate how we can make that food product safe, even though we might have a low salt product. This was Mike had referenced before about what is going to be the fate of Clostridium botulinum in a processed cheese product. 
This is going to be a product that we're going to be taking the cheese, we're going to add some emulsifier, some salt, water, and then we're going to heat it up and then we're going to hot fill it. And what's going to be left in there are going to be potentially spore formers, uh, specifically clustering botulinum is our target microorganism. We have a lot of uh, data that is dated back from the 1980s and from before that demonstrates that the control factors for clostridium botulinum in a shelf-stable processed cheese are going to be moisture, pH, and what we refer to as total salts being sodium chloride plus disodium phosphate. And we have some very good information, and this is stand up for the test of time, that as long as you can uh, formulate uh, on the safe side of the curve, which might include some fairly high levels of total salt, we are going to have a fairly safe product. On the other hand, if you reduce the salt levels um, or increase the pH, you get onto the unsafe side of the curve. So as we're taking a look at, as an example, the um, school lunch program is taking a look at processed cheese products. We're going to try to target uh, lower uh, milligrams of sodium. Uh, we're starting out as a baseline, somewhere going to be about 350 to 400 uh, milligrams per uh, um, ounce, which are one serving. And that is, we're going to be formulating into this area, it's going to be safe, but it's going to be higher than what the target levels are supposed to be for the school lunch program. So how can we get to that lower level? Well, if we just do a strict a reduction in salt levels, then without making any other changes, all of a sudden we get into an unsafe zone. And so this is obviously not something that we want to do, which is try to expose our children to botulism in uh, their school lunch program. So what we're going to try to do, the first obvious thing, is trying to replace it with potassium salt. And as was demonstrated earlier, we're going to have some limitations in there. There's going to be the metallic bitter aftertaste. There may be reduced water holding capacity. And if you're adding on a percentage basis, we'll have uh, reduced antimicrobial activity. So as a result, we started engaging um, with the industry in trying to develop a new predictive model that's going to build on the original model that was published in 1986. And what we're looking at is reducing sodium by uh, substitution with potassium salts, but we're basing this on a molar basis rather than on a percentage basis. We only went up to 50% uh, sodium reduction uh, as a result. We also took a look into potential for fat uh, reduction because we have found out through the years that the lower the fat content, the more stable the product can be uh, because of some very complex systems as far as antimicrobial activity that might be sequestered into the fat phase. And then we also added sorbic acid as a growth inhibitor. What I want to show you now is going to be some examples that we got from this particular model. And notice that this is just a model system. This is not meant for people to take out directly and to make into a product. But let's just say, for instance, that we're going to start with a model system, about 50% moisture, pH of a 5.4. And we're going to be comparing something with 4% uh, total salts, and that includes sodium chloride plus disodium phosphate emulsifier. And what's going to be for milligrams of sodium per serving is about 400 60. This goes beyond the level that we want to be able to have. But what we find out is that we can have 42 weeks out of refrigeration before that potentially has uh, some concern for safety. On the other hand, if all we are going to reduce is the sodium content by reducing the total salt, we will hit our level of sodium target, but we're going to reduce our time to failure from 42 weeks to 5 weeks. Once again, very substantial uh, reduction in safety by reducing the uh, salt content in here. In this particular case, what we did was we, we still reduced the sodium content, but we kept the total salts the same by substituting in potassium. And so we have, once again, this is on a molar basis, not on a percentage basis, but did a 25% potassium replacement and a 50% potassium replacement and found out that uh, statistically they weren't significantly different for the amount of level of safety compared with if we came down to that same level of milligrams of sodium but didn't include that uh, a potassium replacement, we have definitely much, much difference in the time to toxicity for each one of those. 
Now, once again, because there is the potential for um, that off flavor when it comes to potassium salts, we took a look at some other options, which is adding uh, sorbic acid. And we've known for decades that sorbic acid is a very powerful anti-botulinum agent, but it hadn't been included in any of uh, the models. So in this particular case, once again, we took a look at the total salts being a lot lower. Um, so we hit our milligrams of sodium that we were going to be for the target. But you can see as you add uh, 0.1 and 0.2 percent sorbic acid, once again, you've substantially increased the amount of safety from uh, only five weeks to failure to over a year to multiple years uh, of safety just by adding 0.1 or 0.2 percent sorbic acid. So once again, demonstrating how powerful this can be. And this is going to be a real potential in a way in which we can reduce the sodium content by adding a certain kind of an ingredient. Now, the problems with sorbic acid is that in some countries, sorbic acid is not allowed. And so if you wanted to uh, transfer this to Japan, you would be out of luck. And because they don't allow sorbic acid, it is being part of their processed cheese. Now, this is once again just a model. And it does need further validation. And as discussed, that does take time. But what this demonstrates is that there is potential to reduce our salt content through a couple of different mechanisms. But it can't be just uh, strict uh, salt reduction. It's going to have to take in consideration other types of additions. So in summary, uh, reduction of sodium salts, and I want to put that in plural uh, because that includes sodium phosphate uh, as well as sodium chloride in dairy products and other cheese products really require a real understanding of microbial ecology and their interaction between uh, different factors to ensure safety. Uh, we can reduce the sodium content um, by reducing the sodium salt only if we substitute them with other kind of barriers. We can reduce the acidity, which is going to have some impact. We can add other types of antimicrobials, such as sorbic acid, or we can uh, make some direct substitution on a molar basis with potassium salt, but there will be some limits, and we still will never be able to el totally eliminate the sodium salts. Regardless, any of the changes, if we're going to ensure safety, are going to have to be validated. And with that, that's it. Thank you. This one? Okay. Uh, did you, have you researched nicin or any other bactericins for controlling clostridium botulinum in processed cheese? Well, there had been quite a bit of work earlier about using nicin, and we've done a little bit since that time. It's, it's not a panacea. Uh, can you use it? Is it anti-botulinum? The answer is yes. But at the levels in which you have to add it in order to get really good activity, uh, it ends up being pretty cross prohibitive. Uh, the other thing I always want to warn people is that way too frequently, people will buy it as nasaplin, which is only partially nicin, and the rest of it is basically nonfat dry milk and salt. And they think that they're adding, uh, you know, 200 parts per million of nicin, and they're adding 12 parts per million of nicin. And as a result, they don't have great activity. The other thing is that nicin is way more active at a lower pH than it is at a higher pH. And so when somebody wants to have it at a pH of 6, they're getting just a little bit of antimicrobial activity. If they want to drop it down to a 5-4, they get substantially more active antimicrobial activity. So can it be used? Yes. Uh, is it going to be as powerful as ascorbic acid? Absolutely not. 